Hello everyone, today we talk about the Paris system in the time of Ferdinand I of Leon Castille. Uh, the Paris were essentially a tribute that the Christian realms of northern Iberia levied from the uh, Andalusian, actually the broader Muslim Typhus in the south, in this starting from this phase essentially that as you know had uh, it was already consequential the, the fragmentation the end actually of the uh, of the Cordoban Caliphate and thus also its political unity and in fact the uh, the acceleration right of the Reconquista pace that as we will see today also relatively to the Paris was still you know to 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 actually reach the the speediest uh, only in the 13th century, so we're looking at a time which was still somehow a balance, also a possibility from from the Muslim side to reinject forces, as you know, with you know, the Almohads, the Almoravids. Uh, at some point, uh, some Christian territories that had been reconquered were in turn conquered back again by the Muslims. So the Paris um, tribute system ensured. Um, a great deal of um, political um, and military mechanisms that were, as we will see, essentially also part of the broader competition between the Christian realms, rather than just um, a concerted push towards towards the south. These tributes that were, in fact, as we will see, also an alternative to war. And at least mm, tributes are normally um, levied uh, or mm, given, like. Uh, as a normal political interaction still happens today um, but entailed an enormous amount of wealth right during the 11th century there is essentially the shift in trade balance between the Christian and the Muslim world with the former essentially taking over the latter and so ever more m precious metals flowing towards the north uh, and contributing in this case to the political institutional consolidation of the Christian Iberian kingdoms, um, which would fuel, in fact, further also military development. I recently made yet another video about the Reconquista, the you know, um, the terminologies uh, uh, used uh, to define certain type of, of of military expeditions as opposed to others, and so on that are somehow confused because it's still like I, I like to call the Reconquista in the sense the big far west of medieval Europe because it literally is uh, in many ways not just ge geographically but also you know for essentially fighting style uh, and uh, the um, and the Paris uh, therefore represent in a way the, the, the failure in a way of, of, of that uh, Islamic unity of on the same Islamic moral force in Iberia at that point, or at least as far as the local typhus were concerned, with essentially this more primitive mm, mm, polities from the north managing essentially to impose on them tributes, sacking away from from the locals an enormous amount of wealth, and thus proving the fact that they were the stronger, that they had the upper hand. Uh, this aspect, I think, is particularly important because um, the uh, we we talked recently also about the Cordoban Caliphate. What were the the broader difficulties of keeping uh, the Iberian Peninsula together, and so what the the collapse in the universal imperial ideal of, in fact, of the Islamic uh, rule uh, in in the Iberian Peninsula may have shattered, like in fact the also the, the typhus per se, they were not, it's not that they were particularly weak, right? Uh, the Reconquista, as you know, took, as we were saying, a, a long time before it could be uh, accomplished. And still, technically, uh, the Reconquista, this is very few people actually know this, but it ended in the 13th century, not in 1492, right? Because eventually other, the, the, the remaining Islamic powers uh, in the Barren Peninsula declared themselves as vassals of the Christian kings um, and thus this effort was w was over in practice once you have recognized this uh, domination fundamentally that that stays like that so 
naturally imposing this tribute had a lot to do with it in practice, because if these powers had had enough strength to oppose themselves, they would have simply tried to, to fight a way out. Uh, it is true that, of course, every reality is different, so economically wise, uh, the same the same Christians preferred tributes to, to wars of conquest at some point that were somehow more dangerous, more expensive, uh, and so on, but it's obvious that if this dramatic metal flow towards the north w was standing, it's because the, the south was actually, while materially richer, because of course the, the richer, the most advanced mm, part of, of the, the peninsula was, was in the south, since ever, right? Um, the um, the actual moral capacity, like to, 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 f to put up a struggle to oppose themselves to this was, was vanishing, right? And the reasons are many. I have, at this point, a, a satisfactorily long playlist, let's say, on the Reconquista, so we have talked about it here and there, and I'm glad that this year we managed to actually to discuss it more, because together also with French history, we've never really made, you know, as much as it deserves. And basically the history of medieval Spain is, is the Reconquista, right? Let's be quite honest about that. This informed the entire political, cultural, social development. So it's um, it's something that must be still also studied properly. Like, for example, today we will be talking about Fer uh, Ferdinand I, so this, the, the most powerful uh, Iberian ruler in the mid-11th century, uh, that managed, as we will see, to levy powers from from the, the West, to, from the Atlantic to Mediterranean, fundamentally. And as far as Sevilla, um, in, in, the, in the far south, uh, from the Islamic world, of uh, of the peninsula, but um, we is is geographically speaking that we don't know so much. At least this is it's not uh, in part of this this part of this history is not being researched adequately. Uh, in part, we also properly know a few, right? And it's somehow striking because from the uh, medieval warfare videos about the Reconquista, we have often pointed out that Spain was particularly advanced, um, also from a technological point of view, and while it is true that this is this was mostly a, a consequence in this uh, early high medieval centuries uh, of the dramatic Islamic development that had surely impacted the, the local uh, warfare from, from the external, and the local warfare was importantly advanced. In fact, also in the north were some advancements, adaptations in Panoply, uh, etc., that um, sometimes they even procur, even Renaissance uh, military technology, maybe, of course, not in the form of, you know, when I was water, or even, you know, gunpowder um, technology, all these things. I'm talking about certain arms and armor designs that are particularly advanced. Very often we can't assess whether it, it's real or not because they are iconographic sources, but they're very unique in their kind and seemingly even more advanced in countries like France, Italy, where the, the essentially the most there in the Western world was being successfully developed in that kind of more, say, standard Frankish military culture that also Spain would essentially grow to, to be a part um, of. So it's all very complex because just the other day we were talking about Western Francia in the uh, exactly in these uh, years, as a matter of fact, or actually slightly later, the end of the 11th, beginning of, of the 12th century. And as we will see, there is a connection here to, uh, for example, the the Tower of Cluny III, the third, the one you can still see uh, at the Abbey, was actually founded with the Paris levied by Ferdinand the first. Right, that devolved, as, as we will see, uh, actually a, a considerable amount of gold to the uh, monastic foundation in Burgundy, which, which is uh, to strengthen international ties and, and more. Right, but it's uh, this tells you also how you know the effects more broadly on a continental scale. This this thing really really was it really was a lot of wealth, a lot of precious metals, gold, silver and or other, say, luxury products, like jewelry, textiles, uh, other luxury goods of sort. 
There is also, as we were hinting at before, um, a political and strategic reflection in this all. Because, of course, the Reconquista, as we have described, especially in this 11th century, was a dramatically brutal and primitive time in, in, ma in many ways. It uh, was based in re rewards uh, in, in land, plunder, slaves. Um, so th there was, of course, also broader moral prestige deriving from what was essentially still an imperial mindset. We've seen it in the caliphate that, after all, had dominated de facto, even if not you know, locally uh, and very often in a decentralized way, but also up to the north at some point, and even recently, um, to endanger the same Christian realms that, however, in part submitted. Um, the, mm, the same, in fact, Christians had an idea of, um, you know, in what would be, be known as Imperatores um, Totius Hispania, that is, literally, you know, these were considering themselves as the rulers, not just of, say, the Iberian Peninsula broadly meant, but also the God-chosen rules over the Christians, the Muslims, and the Jews of the Iberian Peninsula. We've seen how the Mudayar populace was in many areas that would be reconquered also in some sort of you know, close times to, to this one, where even probably the majority of, 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 of the people, of the population, so when also that we speak of the Reconquista, we have to bear in mind that most of the Christian success was about winning over the moral support of the Muslim and the Jewish population, without which they could have never fundamentally uh, dominated uh, the, the entire space, especially in the larger case of Leon Cassie, but it's valid in, on smaller scale for also for the other kingdoms. Um, there, there is a debate, as far as I know, in, in Spain, of course, in, in Portugal, about uh, the, you know, how, how many people were actually, like, in, in Muslim Spain, Christian or Muslim or Jewish. Uh, it's not easy uh, to, to understand that, but, of, but we have some important indicators, of course, at least we've seen for the Kingdom of Valencia, it was up to something like a 40%. Um, of uh, Mudayars, etc. Uh, in some areas, they were definitely majority. Naturally, the religious faith uh, had in, in those uh, realities a lot of syncretism attached. There was, there had been, after all, a functional uh, caliphal government for for a couple of hundred years that um, functioned also, uh, in fact, on the base of the also of a large Christian population. So. These things we will see perhaps better in, in another video dedicated to those times and places, because today we mostly look at the other side. Um, but let's say that that was the ultimate goal, like showing in this still quite far from decided um, contest uh, that was also in fact quite not even wholly outlined, at least in political practice and, and theory as well as a dichotomic struggle between the two uh, or more religions, how much, let's say, this, this system owed to a, to a coexistence and uh, how much war cost for, for everyone involved, right? And there is this historiographical debate as well as about the, the cost of war, right? Um, economists trying to sort out war, just, you know, making arithmetics. And this is not really how, how you do it, right? People observe. But there were some wars that uh, cost more than uh, the, the, the benefit that you could gain. Uh, how do you measure that benefit exactly, right? Because most of what is going to happen is unpredictable per se. So, of course, at the end of a war, you can say, okay, this was like, a, you know, it was a mistake, like, or it cost too much. And at the end of the day, we didn't get what we wanted. But it's obvious that... Um, there, there are some political strategic measures that would m you know, make the, the various rulers reflect um, on the necessity of whether conquering or not. And, and the latter, um, say, conquering a new place, of course, would have meant to seize entirely all the local resources, right? Unless they, they were particularly destroyed by the same clash um, so that further crisis could enhance. So the Conquista rulers were quite methodic in their, in their mm, strategic 
fact, procedures. They tended to be very careful about not also because they were limited by the same shortage of resources that I mean in this case by the eleventh century it's kind of obvious. The system was very delicate, very fragile, it, it was easily exhausted, there was a very few surplus, right? So it was mostly a very methodic campaigning revolving around the you know the the pol mostly of course the political and that's where the power is also um fit. Um but also males of course seizure of uh, s strongholds one by one very slow erosion that however on the longer run brought uh, the north to be victorious so the flow of wealth towards the north was is to be seen also as a sort of investment of the same local um taifa rulers at, at a time to be fundamentally integrated within the northern system because it seemed to them at that point to be more profitable for themselves and then for their future right they were of course, Muslim rulers under Christian overlords that were perfectly, you know, fine allies, etc., and they were serving together with them, um, and vice versa. The point. I mean, just think about um, El Cid Campeador, so the 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 greatest uh, symbol, right, of the of the Christian hero, by the way, that regularly fought also against um, against Christians, uh, and was pretty friendly with with some Muslims and for whom he, he fought, in fact. So this um, this aspect, I in my opinion, is overlooked, right, as, as, as opposed to just the wealth that, that is impressive of, of the Paris uh, tribes per se. Um, Ferdinand I in 1064 was able to push as far as Coimbra. So we are in, in Portugal. Um, to, to to the very lowest extreme in some areas that will be in fact also difficult to maintain. You know, that we made a bit about medieval Portugal. We have seen how the kingdom emerged, the local kingdom emerged from from the uh, the county that was essentially part of the previous um, Leonese Castilian reality, and then managed to, to to secede and to become in fact a kingdom uh, on its own. Uh, and that that was also a frontier. You know, itself, the Portugal was even less kind of feudal than the north, um, and it, uh, it, however, had seemingly kind of more kind of average freeman participation as militias to, to warfare also because they were, in fact, more exposed in a more unstable area that would take more time to secure. Uh, and the, the, the conquest of Coimbra had um, entailed a six-month-long siege that by the 11th century is an enormity and in a strictly material sense the, the campaign wouldn't compensate for the the huge expense that this entailed but again pushing as far as Coimbra meant a lot all over the Iberian Peninsula showed that the Leonese Castilian power was um, revived that that was also a direction towards which effectively um, uh, the one could push as the, the enemy resistance would finally give way. Uh, it was a way, of course, of asserting also a, a hierarchical model. Ferdinand was properly king, and as such, we don't have to think that you know everybody agreed on such um, or was supporting him because uh, the, the nobility didn't like. Uh, essentially in positions from uh, overlords still it's a moment in which still kings are uh, are premi inter pares and as such as are warriors and um, owe much of their success in fact to, to, to military one per se so I would say that uh, at least we don't have the mean to, to evaluate how whether uh, these campaigns were just um, you know, a loss of, of of energies, or as I think, actually a long-term investment. Aside from, of course, everything that could go wrong at all times, and would go, by the way, very often, too. So that effectively, in fact, these lands would be lost to Castile on on the longer run. But that's not the point. At, at, at in that moment, it contributed. This contributed to accumulate further power in Castile and having a larger power base to f further continuing this kind of imperial policy. It's obvious that when 
youth out that eventually attacking full forces like a, a taifa would be and so that would entail in this southern European context also as we've seen before Coimbra besieging a, somehow a urbanized center with important fortifications still from okay, say from Roman times the Muslims had implemented those etc um, but it would cost a lot for it's, it's just like today in fact you, you want to invade and conquer for good another state it's extremely expensive right the, the system is not entirely the same thing but consider that there is not really a uh, such thing like a an equivalent to to, to a deterrent power like uh, nuclear weapons so it's not uh, oh, in, in any time in history it's directly proportional but it still it gives you an idea of, of the cost you have to win again as we were saying before over the, the population so in, in many ways you can also harass the enemy you can lay waste it, its countryside you can gradually erode its power base and that way you can show you are the stronger but what about you fundamentally start absorbing this as a client state you ask them for hash money fundamentally by saying you know if you if you don't give me this tribute i will i will race to the ground a, a very important part of your your country you will also as a local ruler be weakened in front of the say international community and what about instead like you accept that you're you're weaker fundamentally and i will keep you in power but you become ever more kind of say closer more more say, absorbed by by my own right and so the parties fundamentally correspond to this because of course the local rulers would maintain a direct control but uh, they would have to pay for it and that's how tribute was often preferred to action uh, the Christian rulers of eastern Spain and in particular the Count of Barcelona Ramon Berenguer I had already set an interesting trend even before Leon Castille uh, as around 1045 uh, we uh, documented the first Paris demand uh, uh, from the enfeebled Taifa kings of al right, in the historical, in, in absolute terms. In return, however, this is, in fact, the interest, it was an agreement, right, it was not mere, like, just give me the money, I will also provide you with military, say, protection in exchange. Not, naturally, this, like, again, meant basically taking over control of some areas uh, considered that the politics like the, the county of Barcelona were were more modest in power they also had even actually less central power than the more continental Iberian like Leon Castile was it would be effectively the most monarchic also feudal system institution in, in institutional culture on the long run but in a sense the um, Islamic um, kings of the Mediterranean co coast of uh, Iberia were mm, somehow more isolated. They just they were suffering more from also the intervention of the um, uh, the Italian navies in support of the uh, uh, Christian Iberians uh, on the coast and so on. So they were probably the easiest in the sense to to give way um, in that regard. Um, and as we'll see, actually, the relations were were very complicated because this Paris could entail actually a um, a defensive alliance against even Christians. So, of course, there was a lot of competition between Christian kingdoms that often fought against each other. Now, Ferdinand I of Leon Castile does not seem to have levied Paris in any systematic way until the final years of his reign. Uh, this may have, as we were saying before, been a an obvious necessity say if you have military power to spend you just conquer and in the sense you can acquire more right inst instead than kind of leaving the, the situation suspense because you're just yes sucking the enemy dry in re in life but you're sucking the ec enemy economic resources but you're not quite making that further step that is needed to, to take over locally right so Ferdinand was a quite successful um, commander as well 
as we have seen with the same example of Coimbra, it was just you know uh, the, the the top of his military curriculum in some way. Um, and it's at the end of his reign that uh, he starts arranging the parias also for uh, Leon Castillo. Uh, in fact, we know that by uh, the time of his death in 1065, Ferdinand was receiving regular payments, in, so parias, from the taifas of Badajoz, Toledo, and Zaragoza. This is quite interesting because it's all across. I mean, longitudinally, the Iberian board, right? You go from the west, the center, and the east. Uh, also, this regard proving that you really have de facto control of a great part of, of the Christian space itself, because again, there are other politics, especially in the northeast, that are not under Castile, Leon. They're more difficult, of course, they, Castile would, would ne never manage to expand there. But also because they were somehow entrenched in the mountains, they had also less power, as we've seen, on their own. But this the Guy power uh, showed again on this enormous, the most, especially on Toledo. But the other the other cities are important as well. Toledo is the key to the Iberian control, right? So that eventually, in fact, Castille would shift, as you know, that its center uh, there after conquered the city in, in a few in a few decades actually um, so as you understand it's also a program it's again we have exhausted many resources now let's get tribes so that we can replenish our coffers and we can also arrange for example larger armies for further expansion so this, this is kind of a wise aptitude I would say politically we know that Ferdinand levied Paris occasionally also from the rulers of Seville and Valencia. So the far south and also probably beyond, uh, you know, on, the, on the Mediterranean coast, um, respectively, and showing again how far, right, basically on all the Iberian Peninsula, these tri uh, tributes were um, d demanded and exact. Um, we're talking about substantial amounts of money. Right, we know that uh, Ferdinand was reportedly promised from uh, Al Muzaffar of Badajoz the payment of five thousand gold dinars, right, as a sort of typical um, fact payment. Um, and as such, if we consider again the the amount of cities here, just we don't try to make. The major cities, at least, we don't try even to compare them per se. Badajoz was not the largest. Uh, it wouldn't be, um, let's say, irrealistic to think that every year the Leonese Castilian monarch received 25 gold pieces, which is a freaking lot, right? And if you look at Ferdinand's successors, such as Alfonso VI, um, you know that he got uh, as much as 70,000 gold dinars from his Islamic tributaries. Now consider, of course, that the system was also expanding per se, so there was still a growth in the Islamic South. So, as you know, all Europe is in, in these centuries booming economically. But it's obvious that this wealth still was controlled politically and militarily by the most powerful rulers. Of, of the peninsula. Um, we, um, as we were saying before, we, we uh, ha see that next to hard currency there was jewelry, textiles, luxury goods, and, and more, right, relics even. Ferdinand I even recovered in 1063 the mortal remains of Saint Isidore of Seville from his client Al Mutadid, who in fact was ruler of the city, um, so this this is also a, a part of, of European history, like the actually peaceful uh, uh, process of relic restoration from Islamic rulers that who needed them also to please the Christian subjects in many ways, and probably also, you know, thought of highly of these figures of these models also comparatively in 
the Islamic religion to, let's say, again, to support its power, but as a broader local culture that was typical, as we've seen properly, in the barian nature of what had been the caliphate and so on. Um, we, for such an early age, don't have, uh, understandably, details about the arrangements uh, and the agreements uh, between Ferdinand and his client uh, states, right? Um, we're lucky, however, to know something about um, some other Iberian kingdoms. Uh, from other paria treaties, um, such as the one, for example, between Al-Muqtadir of Zaragoza and Sancho Garces the Fort of Navarre in 1069 and 1073. Right, so Navarre is just over Zaragoza, so even here you realize that there is that degree of imperial reach proximity, um, you know, uh, strategic uh, range uh, for uh, of the operations, the campaigns, etc. So the possibility of coming to levy that money, the locals do not want to give to you. So that arrange force, military base is, is crucial in all this. So the 1073 agreement between Zaragoza and Navarre uh, that um, was stipulated um, between the, the two rulers entailed the Muslim payment of 12,000 gold pieces a year to the Christian king, right? Or their equivalent in silver, by the way. In return, the Navarrese monarch undertook to persuade the king of Aragon further east so of, uh, of Zaragoza by force if, if necessary to withdraw from the territory around Huesca from which the Aragonese were essentially harassing the type of Zaragoza. This is, again is, is very interesting because you have essentially a Christian king who steps in a way says this um, cow to milk is mine right? you, and other Christians cannot harass it right? because otherwise I will actually intervene militarily. And in fact, Zaragoza and Navarre agreed to, mo to provide mutual military assistance um, independently from whether the enemy was Christian or Muslim. And as you understand, this means a sort of political compaction that entails Muslim support to a Christian ruler and vice versa, also within the competition between Christian rulers. It's obvious that if Zaragoza had been more powerful and threatening, the Christians would have allied against it. So this tells you that religion basically had nothing to do with this, or at least there were of course some dynamics connected with it, but not in the hardcore political and strategical ones. And so as, w as we've seen, the, the numbers involved, uh, the sums involved, are, are really big, right? They're gigantic for those times, as a matter of fact. Um, and as a consequence, they began to reshape the uh, what had been otherwise fundamentally the, the impoverished Christian uh, kingdoms. Um, most of this money would be invested in the military, as it was obvious for those time standards. Basically, the, the greatest expenses of any power at the time were military, because also m most of the government functioned in a decentralized fashion and also because there was factually no other way to, to, to control militarily and directly, I mean, in a centralistic fashion, uh, the, the system. So the, the, the military need was proportional to that degree of instability, right? And that's why these peoples made war all the time. That's how civilization developed in the process. It, it's fair to say that an important deal of the Christian military development in, in the north owed to this Moorish gold and silver. Uh, and this is a time, again, of, of rampant expansion of in fact, Christian military force, right? Armies become ever better equipped, organized, larger. Uh, they, uh, the, there is also a lot of castle building from which essentially Castillo also takes its own 
symbol, you know, in, in the in the coat of arms and so on. Um, so you understand the militarized area, mostly uh, in fact the frontier one, where the most important thing was to secure this forts this and and, and uh, strengthening them further, right? Uh, this is what central Spain at the end of the day it really is, right? This is a terrifying ground, terrifying weather. Uh, this uh, partly desolated areas scattered, you know, with this hilltops and forts. This is not very, and, and constant guerrilla skirmishes, harassment, but it's not very different from what, she, from what it had been, in, say, at the time of, of the uh, Romans and, and the, and the Celtiberians, or, say, at the time in which the Visigoths were trying to, to you know, to control the entire, um, the entire peninsula with, with some, you know, important uh, centrifugal push. The same goes for, for, for the Caliphate. So, again, this is always the case. So it, it's a deeply militarized reality since since millennia at this point. And so the populations are also up to this. As you know, there is a lot of also cattle raiding. The mounted warfare has particular importance. That's what I call I call it the, the far west. In many ways, this this continuous warfare would damage local agriculture. So that um, as we've seen. Also, by the late Middle Ages, these areas were quite productive in terms of cattle breeding, uh, uh, wool production. We made multiple videos of one also just recently about late medieval European cattle breeding because uh, it had been impossible throughout all these centuries to develop, to, to, to provide with that local stability to develop kind of intensive agriculture, something took a lot of time, a lot of infrastructure system because every once in a while some, uh, someone arrived and raised everything uh, to the ground. Um, there is even the capacity now from the Christian monarchs to build or acquire ships, which I, I made a video about the late medieval Castilian fleet, by the way. Uh, it is true that basically except from the, the maritime republics in Europe, nobody really had something like permanent navy, like they just record them ad hoc and so on. But I'd say it was important also for uh, Leon uh, in, in the north to have an important, some, some minimal naval capacity to, to comfort some, well, some of them, essentially what was the overwhelmingly continental strategic um, Goal, right? We have seen here also uh, the Portugal, the, the Atlantic from uh, in the west is, is rich, so um, they needed these forces at some point, even though intermittently and so on, but still with some infrastructure also to serve them ports, uh, shipyards, uh, m little stuff by the 11th century, but still. Um, they mostly ships eventually for more important engagements would be hired, right? Mostly from uh, the Italian maritime republics, but they cost, right? So they needed money for that service too. And regarding this also kind of um, development of the, the military art, you realize that money was spent in this very years by the Christian rulers of, of Spain to hire experts in siege techniques from abroad, mm. which evidently shows the necessity for siege warfare, so properly storming, conquering, for for a, with a permanent strategic uh, objective. And uh, interestingly enough, in the sense, the necessity of of requiring some foreign expertise. Right, and especially continental Spain did need that in some way because it was kind of a, a rougher world than some, at least, of the most advanced in, in Europe in a qualitative sense. Between 1062 and 1072, Ramon Berenguer I of Barcelona is reckoned to have lavished at least 10,000 ounces of gold on the purchase of castles alone. This is interesting because it shows that, of course, it was plenty of castles that were built independently on the comital rule, and this is particularly true 
uh, in Catalonia, where mm, power was, say, wealth was much more evenly spread, so there was a, a lower degree of centralization, and there was never like a strong uh, ru central ruler per se. Uh, but this also meant that as, as much as you could profit economically also from, from the rising uh, maritime traffics, um, the, the ever greater interest in that regard in, in the Mediterranean islands, also think about the Balearics that would be conquered from, from the Muslims, uh, there was a possibility of probably using this cash coming from the Paris to buy castles. And there were people who literally built, say, built castles to eventually sell them, not to create kind of a lordship locally on their own. This is did, this did happen, which tells you the degree also of wealth was starting to circulate. Again, thanks also to essentially the much more brutal military business, the capacity of threatening, of menacing the, the typhus and being paid lavishly in the process. Um, and of course, we're not just talking about kings or great noblemen, right? but the entire nobility in this far west is finding ways to 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 aggrandize themselves and to seize the opportunities that um, presented to them. So these were uh, adventurers, there were lots of foreigners by some degree. Um, there was a, a, a huge frontier to, um, to, to penetrate and so lots of, of war, lo lots of money, so this meant that of course as the typhus could spend this money for paying for, for military protection etc they could also hire mercenaries right and m many of them were Christian as well so um, I in any case the same average kind of I don't know uh, Castilian or Aragonese nobleman could exact his own paria from a local Muslim lord right in some way and and this meant that there are stories of great success like the one of the Catalan nobleman Arnal Mir de Tost who mm, accumulated a, a vast fortune for himself in money, land, castles, luxury goods uh, and so on thanks essentially to, to a mercenary lifestyle and the capacity of, in fact also of threatening of receiving uh, tributes um, etc stealing cattle and so on. Um, some also of the most important art in Christian Spain that we can admire today from from that 11th century was paid with that Moorish gold. Religious institutions such as the cathedral churches of Yaca, Pamplona and Urgel, um, the monastic houses of Nayera, uh, San Juan de la Peña, uh, were surely uh, among these, right? They benefited enormously from, from the Paris. We've seen Cluny before. Um, in 1048, Count Armengol III of Urgel, who ruled between 1038 and 1065, uh, undertook to deliver to his local see one tenth of his future income from Islamic Paris. Um, so, it's like again 10% of your entire income fundamentally derived from this and being naturally invested locally and as you know especially monastic foundations were an enormously uh, convenient asset especially as long as you could place some of your um, daughters or, or cadet sons let's say as abbesses or abbots and you could therefore still make it a private uh, possession and enjoying at the same time all the uh, the ecclesiastical immunities towards this kind of foundation um, and you can see that some of the pictures I've inserted here are in fact from this very churches and monasteries that we listed and you see also how sizable they were right how much they cost in, in stone etc we're talking again about the 11th century it's still a very archaic time um, while it's true that in southern Europe stone buildings were more frequent still they were very very expensive right just by the 12th century comparatively that in Europe you start seeing 
like probably also stone castles and so on this this um, this wealth of course derived from from the resources of the rich south um, and it, they it just made they made a great impression internationally and that's why Ferdinand would finance the, the tower at Cluny by the way of course today we don't talk about it but oh, this brawler reconquista fort etc had an enormous international negotiation with the popes with um, the other uh, Christian kings um, uh, there were all dynastic issues uh, clientels um, conflicts of course so it's all part of a much bigger game um, Ferdinand um, provided specifically 1,000 gold pieces a year to the Burgundian Abbey of Cluny. So it's also a continuative amount of wealth, right? because you can't just... Um, in the and in this sense, think of how important it was to invest abroad in terms of what could return to you in terms of international, power, say, connections, uh, than in the same in the same Leon Castille, uh, which tells you also again how deeply intertwined Europe really was already at the time. Alfonso the Sixth, Ferdinand's son, would double to in fact two thousand gold pieces the annual donative to Cluny in ten seventy seven. So you see there probably a, a long term uh, connection um, and. Of course, we see just uh, with these examples that it's not just the Leonese Castilian monarchy that was habituated to the, the, the Parias. Again, this was a normal way of uh, dealing uh, politically at the time. You find tribes everywhere. It's just the, the scale of it that is impressive and the, somehow the, the homogeneity of what seems to have been the, the, the practice and this gradual properly absorption of the typhus um, in the process. Essentially you were buying those countries out right? and this would favor the further um, conquest later, integration later. Um, by the death of Ferdinand I on December the 29th, 1065, um, we can assess the monarch's success, in fact, in having reduced several of the wealthiest Taifa uh, kingdoms to tributary status. Right? This politically is, is parallel even just to Ferdinand's military accomplishments that we will see some other time, because we've seen were pretty consistent. Um, and this would make him de facto that the most powerful monarch uh, in in the Berrien Peninsula at the time, there is a, a passage from the 14th, the early 14th century, um, Islamic uh, author Ibn Idari, uh, that um, essentially would be the uh, the content of uh, an embassy of Ferdinand the First to Toledo. Right, uh, that was not yet conquered by the Castilians, and it sounds something like this. Bear it in mind; it's from essentially almost 300 years later. Quote, "We seek only our lands, which you conquered from us in times past, at the beginning of your history. Now you have dwelt in them for the time allotted to you, and we have become victorious over you as a result of your own wickedness." So go to your own side of the Straits of Gibraltar and leave our lands to us for no good will come to you from dwelling here with us after today for we shall not hold back from you until God decides between us. Naturally, uh, this is not what you know, a, a Leonese Castilian embassy would have sounded like, um, especially in, in the end of Ferdinand's life, right? The uh, here the Islamic author is being ideological. It's a beautifully written piece, 
but of course it um, fits the broader narrative of, of the struggle between Christians and Muslims and so on. And we don't have to think, of course, that these kind of feelings that don't exist, or even that this kind of words were not used. The, the point is that the say sovereigns like the Leonese Castilian ones at this point, as we were saying before, had to win over the decisive moral support of the Islamic and Jewish populations. And also the one, of course, of the Christians who were still kind of okay uh, maybe in the local taifas, because, you know, that was essentially how they had been pr from centuries, uh, and they were just uh, in their business. So the idea that, in this case, Ferdinand would have truly committed himself to a, to a deliberate policy of reconquest to the point of systematic subjugation of the peninsula and so on is, as far as I know, historiographically debated. It is also to be researched. Um, surely, uh, when you look at uh, the arrangements that he made in December 1063, w w he was al already um, ill, right? And he would die two years later, as we've seen. Um, th there is none of that. If in the ninth century, the kings of the Asturias had already, of course, considered, conceived the restoration of a unitary Christian state and embracing the entire uh, Iberian Peninsula like a, a viable or a pressing objective. And if that would be kind of obvious because it was, the Iberian Peninsula is a sort of world on its own and so its control, as we've seen, was already idealized universally as by, by the, the, the Cardamon Caliphs that were also the ones actually coming the closest to it in practice at the time. So there was also a lot of Islamic influence for that matter in the political ideologies of the North. But they, they were mirroring each other. Right? I mean, that they were fighting each other, but they, they had the same ambition at the end of the day. Well, in the second half of the 11th century, the situation was quite different because, again, a 9th century king of the Asturias is just essentially a marginalized power against a, a giant, like David against Goliath, so you can resume all the kind of we will fight till the end kind of uh, attitude, even if they don't even have the the thought of even dreaming of reconquering the entire Iberian Peninsula, which is huge compared to them. And so it's just like, like we are still alive, we are, we are pressured, we will fight for it. By the 11th century, where the Christians didn't even have, by this point, a half extensionally, and even less, if we speak demographically, also the same wealth of the uh, of the entire Iberian Peninsula. Still, again, they, they were much more diplomatic. They had understood, as we were just saying, that they needed to essentially give a reason also to, to, to the, the Iberian population for being under their rule, right? And the Paris, in this regard, are arguably the first extension of that power. I mean, th these things had not appeared before, the tribes had not been levied um, in, in that scale, basically in on the entire peninsula, from the entire peninsula, but at this point in history. Uh, so there is much that prefigures, that procures um, the, the ultimate end, right, of the Reconquista, with Kurt, of course, uh, mostly just like essentially a couple of centuries later, but also the complete uh, expulsion of, of the Muslims, even if that had been conceived uh, theoretically, was, was not the most important thing for these at all, right? An average uh, Lyonnaise Castilian king at this point was enormously more concerned about feudal matters of its own power, which is in fact also witnessed by um, by Ferdinand's testament. Uh, in fact, just like his father Sancho Garces III before him, Ferdinand chose to partition his realms among his sons. Right? It was still in the phase in which you could not really tell, well, you know, you're, you're the son of a king, so you will get uh, essentially less because, you see, you had, there's a, the, you know, the firstborn son that has to get basically everything, otherwise this thing gets disintegrated was first of all impossible because most of these divisions eventually rested still on the local vassals, um, you know, in fact support, 
um, and it was a way, even if you want to reinforce on a smaller base, but still, you know, large chunks, as we will see now, your inheritance, of what had still to be a unitary power, would essentially maintain itself as such as the kingdom would evolve. In fact, to the eldest son, uh, Sancho II, that would rule between 1065 and 72, Ferdinand granted the kingdom of Castile itself, as far as the river Pisuerga, and this entailed the, also the, the control, the, the, the reception of the Parias owed from Zaragoza, mm -hmm. so the eastern part of Castile, uh, receiving from the further east Zaragoza, the, the well. So this makes a lot of sense, right, because it's also kind of more directly evident that if you're going to rule from that side of your domains, you receive tribes from the guys who were from the other side, from that side as well. Then to Alfonso VI went the territories of Leon and the Asturias, so the north, the more ancestral territories, if you want, and together with that, so in the center of this section, longitudinally, the Parias of Toledo. Mm -hmm. So actually the most important ones, at least as far as the, the immediate territorial aims of, of the monarchy were, were concerned. In fact, again, Toledo would be conquered that soon. Uh, and to his youngest son, Garcia I, ruling between 1065 and 1073, Ferdinand granted Galicia and the Portuguese territories as far south as Coimbra, as we've seen, so the, the western part. Um, also uh, properly on the sea, uh, the, the, the Atlantic uh, latitudinal coastline, and correspondingly, in fact, the Paris from the Taifa of Badajoz, that is in the in the south on the Gersiana, uh, and uh, that is kind of obvious. There was properly a clean, rational parcelization of what had. Probably it was not even a, a huge um, difficulty, you know, finding this. Uh, the, the, the point is, of course, arranging, securing the succession, granting the sons to have some stable rule, and hopefully not to kill each other uh, afterwards, and maintaining, therefore, this great inheritance that had been enlarged also, as we've seen probably with, with, by, the, by the sword of their father, kind of compact. Right, and things would fare well for, for, for the kingdom after all in perspective aside from the fact that of course like Portugal was lost and other things but still Castile would be overwhelmingly the most powerful uh, polity in the Iberian Peninsula later. So I think this is, it's really simple right, it, it obviously uh, shows what were the practical methodical this is the impression that you get right from the the policies of, of medieval rulers that we often think ah oh, these guys were just making war but if, if you have actually studied the sources like not that today we made in, in a considerable fashion but you, you realize that there is always kind of an iron logic there is an enormous quest for 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 rationale right for sensibility for um, for for justice at the end of the day because that was all was technically together with in fact the military power necessary to enforce it the the main need of any civilization so the power is in this regard are uh, a bridge with the territories that are to be newly conquered it there they are uh, essentially a, a way pavement to them and and in this those same typhus were understanding that their golden age was over also because much of their gold was leaving literally uh, from from their um, fr from from them um, and on the longer run the incorporation in the northern realms would, would occur right and especially the northern kingdoms that had functionalized in this kind of land grabbing at this point and growing also backed by the entire kind of western you know way of war um, crusading help the fact that again there was lots of land to grab for also people outside of Spain 
um, in this international relations, as we've seen, and necessities to strengthen ties with the most important political and, uh, say, temporal, spiritual institutions of Europe, would all essentially start the building of the Iberian monarchies that uh, it would make, uh, on the very long run, the, the, the Spanish state, and etc. Right? So they are to be conceptualized as such. I think the, this this uh, lesson on the Paris is is quite quite fascinating. And I have never never heard of them before. Um, you know, is that the measure of how much medievalists should be habituated actually to an international awareness, because these things again must be known. There is no way around that. Right? If you want to stratify, consolidate an important understanding of these systems, it's crucial to analyze these um, details as well. There are, again, mostly in the measure of these tribes, it's the, the most powerful indicator of what you can't otherwise measure. The, the, you can't you could otherwise measure in, in an, uh, its own unit. That is, demoral forces. Because, again, the North was poorer, but it was stronger importantly enough in this context and but they would get ever richer and more powerful in the process so that at the end of the day is this this wealth remains largely within the same the same region but of course it's it's a Europe in important change important acceleration important kind of momentum that also remolds a bit the the centers of power the the ones that have to to, to be established significantly in uh, in an area where previous to that prior to that there had not been um, no, not even properly a, uh, an ecclesiastical organization as we intend this is I think a very important and over overlooked aspect like in the Byzantine Empire even though it collapsed in 1204 you have still kind of a Christian uh, administration which is actually dramatically advanced is by far more advanced than many other modern administrations especially the church the byzantine church not necessarily the, the state per se that's also interesting but at least you had a base in which to move in that sense we have seen i made a video recently in, on the causes if i'm not wrong with the mayad success etc the fact that even though the early is, uh, islamic invasions were quite um quite successful of course and momentous and and uh, incredible under many points of view still Part of the reason is that differently from Latin Germanic Europe um, and the Christian world in general, the, uh, the there was no such thing like an ecclesiastical administration. So, so most of the resources were invested in that in that military effort that was temporal and spiritual alike. Okay, it's true that also in, in the West, uh, aside from bish warring bishops, but think about the 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 same. Iberian monastic orders and of the Reconquist and so on. There wasn't a fort of that kind, but it still was based on the presence of a prior ecclesiastical administration. It means, again, a lot of land, as we've seen also that the, the parishes here are used to, to, found, uh, to, yeah, to found cathedrals, monasteries, and so on. Well, sp the Islamic world didn't have that, right? This concept of the foundation was not. So everything was concentrated in the center, it had been in Cordoba, and then when the thing, you know, is shattered, the entire system crumbles. This is almost a Machiavellian intuition regarding, I don't know, the Ottoman Empire all centralized, is hyper strong and powerful, but if you, you know, behead it, it's over. Whereas if you even behead the French monarch, you still have lots of other states within the state of noblemen that will not give up and fight at every corner. But this is in many ways a different model that makes you understand how there was a difference that had been made, right? And it's as if after the end of the caliphate, uh, the typhus uh, hadn't had the, even though there was for sure a, a lot of intersections, a lot of hybrids, and as we have seen clearly, and also properly the, the typhus of the north were very different also culturally from Andalusia, from from that, you know, the, the south that had been properly the, the, the statal bureaucratic, military professional bulk of, of, of the caliphate and the emirate before um, they they weren't part of a state really they hadn't organized their fort kind of autonomously and this probably um, affected them 
to a point of kind of non-return. And so not even the Almohad and the Almoravid reinjection from North Africa brought in Spain that kind of um, force that was that that kind of robustness that was now required also for fielding such ar armies of that kind. Not that again that the Islamic forces were not strong or or anything. It's just that they they lacked political cohesion as always. So uh, everything was a consequence of that, and that's how, in my opinion, you can explain the the parias. Even again, on the top of that goal, that we could have easily financed military operations and so on, but they understood that they couldn't withstand the blow already at this point. Local, right? Then the grand plans of the revivers of the ancient caliphal order, etc., are another thing, right? But it's still crucial to get this disaster, in my opinion. All right, then, well, for today, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. For now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.